that Jesus Christ is the most supreme, the most sovereign, and the most uh, preeminent figure ever lived in the history of this world. And we are in Pakistan to proclaim the supremacy and preeminence and sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And interestingly, that is the theme of my sermon today, uh, derived from Colossians 1, from verse 15 to the end of verse 20. So I'm going to read before you Colossians 1, 15 to 20. I'm using ESV translation. So whichever translation you may be using, it's fine. But I'm reading from ESV. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus Christ. And this is what he declares by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of of his cross. Amen. The church in Colossae was planted by Epaphras, one of Apostle Paul's disciples sent by him. This letter to the Colossians was written by Paul probably in AD 61. It was written to correct false teaching that had crept into the church. The false teaching was a blend of Jewish and Hellenistic thinking. Christians were in danger of embracing popular syncretism of Jewish and Greek ideas and practices. The misleading teaching included Worship of angels, practice of circumcision, observance of Sabbath, celebration of religious festivals, certain religious festivals, new moon celebrations, and keeping specific food regulations. And the purpose of these rules and practices was to gain some kind of spiritual maturity and advancement. Paul counters this false teaching by clarifying to the church that Jesus Christ is the source and end of true spirituality, wise philosophy, and the law. He declares that the person and work of Jesus Christ is sufficient for human salvation and ethics. Christ is all sufficient. 
Christ is all supreme. Christ is all sovereign. Christ is all preeminent. Christ is all paramount. Christ is prestigious. Christ is the greatest. Christ is the most exalted. Christ is the most excellent. Christ is matchless. Christ is incomparable. And Christ is unbeatable. In first 14 verses of chapter 1, Paul greets the Christians of Colossae. He thanks God for them. And he makes a prayer to God for them. And then he turns to the theme of preeminence of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is a hymn in Greek language. And this hymn, this song, this poetry has similarities to other New Testament hymns about Christ's supremacy. For example, Romans 1, 3 to 4, Philippians 2, 6 to 11, and 1 Timothy 3, 16. Commentators think that Paul wrote this Christ-exalting hymn either by himself or he took it from the early church worship. Another interesting thing is that the story of creation described in Genesis 1 to 2 is in the background of this beautifully and majestically written uh, hymn that describes how supreme and beautiful Jesus Christ is. And while Christ's this greatness is described, his person and his work are combined together. Christ is great because of what he did on the cross for us. And what he did on the cross became possible because in the first place, Christ was great. So as the greatest person in human history, he is central for both creation, our world, our universe, and also for the church, his own people on this planet, purchased by his blood. And as he describes Christ's majesty and beauty, supremacy and preeminence, in verse 15, he says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. This means that to look on the face of Jesus is to look on the face of God. In the incarnate Jesus, God has taken on human form. The idea of image refers to the creation story in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, God created Adam and Eve in his image. Humankind is created in God's image. However, due to sin, this image was distorted, but Jesus takes upon himself this image enters into our world so that through his work of restoration and re reconciliation 
we are again restored back to the divine image that we lost. But also remember that the invisible God has become, in, become visible to us in the person of Jesus. And we human beings are created in God's image. But Jesus Christ is the image of God. He is not just in the image of God as we are. So this challenges us as Christians to reflect Christ's image on to this world through our character, through our words and works, the way the moon takes light from the sun and reflects it on to this dark earth. At night time, we are called to reflect Christ's radiance his brightness and beauty on to this world. We don't have brightness and light of our own, but we take it from him. Do we live lives daily that people can see Christ's image in us? And then in verse 15 it says, Christ is the firstborn of all creation. The idea of firstborn in Jewish tradition could be understood in two ways. Number one is in temporal sense, in the sense of being first uh, in terms of time and sequence of events. The child that would be born first would be called firstborn. But this is not what Paul is saying here. He is not saying that Jesus Christ was created before all of creation. No. Because the scripture clearly teaches explicitly and implicitly that Jesus Christ is pre-existent. He has existed from eternity. He was never created. Fourth century heretic teacher Arius, the presbyter of Alexandria, Egypt, and in 21st century Jehovah's Witnesses, teach that God created Jesus Christ before everything else in this universe. And then through this created being Jesus, God created the rest of the world and the universe. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Christ, as the firstborn of all creation, does not mean that he was the first in the chronology of God's all creatures. The firstborn, this term, can also be understood in terms of status, in terms of rank, in terms of position, or as a title. And I think this is what Paul means when he says Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He is saying that Jesus has the highest rank over all of God's creation. He is supreme ruler over God's created order. And we see these examples in the Old Testament. In Psalm 89 verse 27, King David is called God's firstborn as a designation of his status as the most exalted of the kings of the earth. In Exodus 4.22, God calls Israel my firstborn son because he chose Israel as his covenant people. 
So when the scripture says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation, it means that he has preeminence, supremacy, and sovereignty over all creation. And how amazing it is that God is our Father and Jesus Christ is our elder brother. And my elder brother and your elder brother, Jesus Christ is the ruler, king, and sovereign over this whole universe. That makes us people of special significance, people of exalted identity. Do you feel proud that by being related to Jesus, you belong to somebody who rules over this whole universe? Not just one company, one business, one city, one state or one country. And this elder brother of ours, Jesus Christ, is our ruler too. Do you live a life of surrender before him every day? It is by surrendering to Jesus that we become truly free. And then in verse 16, Apostle Paul goes on to say that Christ is the creator of all things. All things were created by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. He is both the instrument and goal of every aspect of creation. Stoicism, a Roman school of philosophy in Paul's day, taught that the mother nature was the all-embracing source of creation. Paul argues, it is not the mother nature, it is Jesus Christ who is the source of all creation. Jewish creation theology taught that God created the world through his wisdom. Paul advances that teaching and clarifies to the church that the universe, all of creation, was brought into being through Christ, God's personified wisdom, God's wisdom revealed in a person, in a man called Jesus Christ. And Jewish creation theology taught that before creating the world through wisdom, in Proverbs 8.22, God first created the wisdom itself before everything else. But Paul makes it clear that Jesus Christ is not created. He was never created. He is the creator. He is the creator of all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, he is the creator of it all, and he is above it all. He is the king of kings, the lord of lords, the president of presidents, the prime minister of prime ministers, the Chancellor of Chancellors, the Supreme Leader of Supreme Leaders. I believe, as somebody has said, if all of the world leaders 
politicians, military generals, economists, scientists, scholars, philosophers, and other kinds of leaders got together in a room. And during that time, Jesus entered that room. First, they would all get up on their feet, and then they would all kneel down before him. Their pride will be shattered as Paul's own pride was shattered on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. When Christ's glory was revealed to Paul, he fell off that horse and asked, Who are you, Lord? And this Christ, the Creator, wants you to become a new creation in Him by His Holy Spirit through repentance and faith if you have not yet trusted in Him personally. And if you are already a new creation by the creative work of the Holy Spirit, He wants you to grow in His likeness in Christian character by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul says in verse 17 that Christ is before all things. This is a reference to his pre-existence. He precedes everything. He existed before creation took place. You see, we divide time between the past, the present, and the future. What happened before, what is happening now, and what will happen tomorrow. But Jesus Christ is not bound to our scheme of time. What happened before, what is happening now, and what will happen tomorrow, everything is laid bare before him. Our lives are like an open book before Christ the God. Would you allow him to shape the story of your life according to his plan and purpose, and not your own. And this Christ, who is creator and pre-existent, in verse 17 we are told that he holds all things together. In him all things are held together. This means that not only Christ precedes his creation, he also has precedence over it. Not only is he the creator of the universe, but also the sustainer of the universe. You see, the our universe is made of five basic elements. Fire, earth, water, metal, and wood. And then our universe encompasses all of space, time, matter, and energy. And the universe contains everything that exists, from particles of matter smaller than an atom to the largest stars. And here is the amazing and shocking truth that our Lord Jesus Christ sustains all of it from the smallest atom to the largest star in the universe. He keeps it all together and running. And then the solar system of our universe, of this creation, 
consists of our star, the sun, and its orbiting planets, including the earth, along with numerous moons, asteroids, comet material, rocks, and dust. And our sun is just one star among the hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And it is Jesus Christ who provides the solar system the force and energy to keep it coordinated and running. The universe is extremely complex and integrated at the same time. And it is Jesus Christ who provides unity and coherence and integration to this extremely complex creation. It means that Jesus Christ is in control of everything. This means that Jesus Christ is the master of it all. Dutch theologian Abraham Keeper said, There is not a sing square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let's have assurance and faith when we hear of the mess of American-Afghanistan -Afghan war, the coronavirus pandemic, looming economic crisis, global food insecurity, water shortage, nuclear weapons, threat of global warming, fear of natural disasters, future of humanity at risk. Or when we worry about our personal issues, such as health, family, job, finances, relationships or other matters. Let us remember in the midst of worry about these, you know, global, social or personal challenges that Jesus Christ hold all things together in his wounded but mighty hands. We do not know what the future holds, but we know the one who holds the future. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 18, we are told that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. So, the Christ who has supremacy over creation also has preeminence over his church. Jesus Christ is the source of both physical creation, our material world, and also spiritual creation, people becoming new creation in him. The Greeks believed that it was the head that gave life to the body. It was the head that kept the body together and nourished. And Paul here builds on that metaphor. He says that Christ is the head and the church, you, God's people, are the body. For the body, for the church to remain strong, healthy, and moving spiritually, it has to remain connected to its head, the Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the vine. We are the branches. 
he is the head we are the body in order to remain spiritually alive strong and active let us seek to remain connected to Christ Jesus every day and what does it mean for him to be the head of the church it means three things number 1 he has authority over his church his people do you live under christ's sovereignty every day number 2 he has control over his church he is the one who gives direction to the church do you live under his direction and guidance every day and number 3 he provides the force to keep the church the body together do you live as a united body under christ's headship every day in other words do we as a church locally and globally depend on and submit to christ daily and then in verse 18 paul goes on to say that christ is the first born from the dead in verse 15 he declared that christ is first born over all creation now he is saying christ is the first born from the dead what it means is that in god's new age christ is the first one who by the power of the holy spirit rose from the dead with a glorious and immortal body he rose from the dead never to die again people who rose from the dead in the old testament through elijah and elisha people who rose from the dead through christ's own ministry in the gospels they died again and they did not rise from the dead with a glorious and eternal and immortal body jesus is the first one to come back to life from the dead with a new glorious immortal body never to die again and with his resurrection a new age of salvation a new age of eternal life a new age of becoming a new creation in god has started and we are called to participate in this new age first by trusting in christ if we have not done that and second by accomplishing his mission his mission for the church to go out and tell the world that jesus the risen jesus is the answer to their questions the risen jesus is the solution to their problems the risen jesus provides salvation for the lost redemption for the captive and everlasting life for the dead and there is a living hope for us at personal level in this as well john quincy adams the us president from 1825 to 1829 was 80 years old when a friend said to him how is john quincy adams and john quincy adams replied referring to himself john quincy adams himself is very well thank you but the house he lives in is sadly dilapidated <laughs> it is tottering on its foundations 
the walls are badly shattered and the roof is worn out. The building trembles with every wind. And I think that John Quincy Adams will have to move out of it before long. But he himself is very well. Why did he have this assurance? Why was he looking forward to a new glorious immortal house, a new body? Because he believed that Jesus Christ is risen and he is risen forever. And then Paul talks about this risen Jesus that he became, that he made peace by his blood. His blood refers to his atoning sacrifice as an act of sheer grace. Jesus Christ took divine judgment against sin upon himself on the cross. He paid the penalty for the sin of the world. And now, those who trust in him are justified by his atoning sacrifice. Justification is a legal term. It means that we are declared no longer guilty in the divine court. And justification before God leads to reconciliation. We enter into a new relationship with God because of Jesus Christ's gracious atoning work. And you know, this reconciliation, this peace that Jesus made possible by his blood, it has become possible at personal, social, and cosmic levels. At personal level, our relationship with God is restored we find inner reconciliation as well. At social level, whether you are black or white, Hispanic or American or Pakistani, in Jesus Christ we become one family. The way the Jews and Gentiles became one family in the first century because of their common trust in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and then at cosmic level, this earth that came under curse because of sin is now in the process of becoming a new creation after Jesus rose from the dead. And this work of new creation, restoration, will be completed at the time of Christ's second coming. So what are we supposed to do? Until he comes, we are supposed to tell the world that he is supreme, he is sovereign, and he is preeminent. And we are called to surrender to his sovereignty every day. As John Wesley determined, I am no longer my own, but yours, O Lord Jesus Christ, put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you. Or laid aside for you. Exalted for you. Or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly Yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And St. Augustine said, Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. Do you value him above all in, their, in your thoughts, words, and works every day? Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. 
who is preeminent and supreme, help us to surrender to his sovereignty personally and as a church in our daily lives. Help us to tell the world that he is the answer to their questions. He is the solution to their problems. And he is the one who can bring peace and reconciliation in the midst of the division and strife our world is facing and experiencing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.